Uh, I'm Michael Brown, president of SAR, and I'm absolutely delighted to see some old friends and some new faces in this crowd. Um, I hope those of you who aren't members will think about joining us uh, because uh, membership is what keeps this place going and allows for these kinds of events. And we've got membership information in the back and some very efficient membership people. There's Isis Bennett there and she'll help you out if you have questions about that. Um, so basically at this first meeting, which kicks off our academic cycle, we ask the visiting scholars and interns to introduce themselves briefly. So I will introduce them and then do a handoff um, for the scholars, we're going, actually we're going alphabetical order and then we'll, um, then we'll introduce the, uh, the, I'll introduce the, the museum interns and they'll say a few things about their background and their projects. Um, first up is Hector Beltran, who's a Mellon fellow in Latino studies. He received his uh, Bachelor of Science degree from MIT, so he's our, he's our science guy here this year. Um, in computer science, as a matter of fact, he's a doctoral candidate in cultural anthropology at UC Berkeley. The title of his SAR project is Hacking Imaginaries, Code Worlds and Code Work Across the U.S.-Mexico Borderland. Hector. All right, thank you for that introduction. My name is Hector Beltran. Um, as uh, uh, Michael said, the title of my work here is Hacking Imaginaries, Code Worlds, and Code Work Across the U.S.-Mexico Borderlands. Finishing a dissertation at UC Berkeley, and broadly I'm interested in how activism, software development, and entrepreneurship comes together on both sides of the border, and U.S.-Mexico border, and especially uh, what happens when folks come together in the name of community empowerment through technology. So when I was thinking about how to describe what I'm doing in my dissertation, I thought about publics and how I uh, pitch the work to this public and different publics, and I thought about, okay, who am I trying to speak to in my dissertation? I thought about three publics, and I'm going to sort of outline what the dis dissertation is about through these three different publics. So a more general public, let's say, what is a hackathon? Maybe you've never heard of what a hackathon is. Um, it's the combination of hacking and marathon. So the idea is that folks, especially young people, but people of all ages get together, mostly over a weekend, um, network, put teams together, um, decide they're going to resolve some societal problem using an app usually, but it can be a technological platform. Uh, over the span of 72 hours, let's say, um, they develop a prototype, um, they pitch their prototype to investors or some sort of panel of judges, and they decide that this will resolve some problem and that it's an economically viable project. Um, not necessarily profitable, but maybe economically viable. Um, if, if you say, well, I've never heard of this. Is this really going on? I'll throw some numbers at you. Um, an in, infographic I found shows that organizers say in 2016 there were 3,450 hackathons organized, 200,000 participants, and 13,000 prototypes created. So maybe you've been to one of these, or you can imagine, you create something, and then sometimes nothing happens out of it. Um, so there's this sort of politics of making and not making, right, that I want to explore in my, in my project. Um, so why are these things so popular? Why do people keep showing up to these events even though nothing might result out of them? That's one of my main questions also in Mexico, here in the Bay Area especially, why do folks keep showing up when sometimes it's all spectacle, sometimes there's, um, un, there's promises that aren't fulfilled, let's say. So here I want to explore what is the meaning of hacking? What, what does hacking mean? Does it mean repurposing technology for different uh, or unintended purposes? Does it mean some sort of technical competency where you know a system so well you know how to go in through the back door and here we can think about system not just in the technological sense but any sort of system right and um, if you're going to come to the talks uh, Biela Komen who sort of is one of the founders of the anthropology of hacking let's call it will be here in the spring and she um, did her ethnography with hackers who say even if you go and read the, the Communist Manifesto, you should read that too, but the Hacker, of, uh, the hacker ma Manifesto, um, it says, you know, hackers are not about any bogus criteria like race, class, nation, culture. Hackers are about hacking, right? So it's looking at this undifferentiated community. Well, here my anthropologist side is going to come in and say, well, hold on, let's, let's think about difference, right? What happens when hacking is inflected by 
uh, identity, class, nation. So that leads me to my next group that I hope I can speak to, anthropologists, right? If I want to publish this eventually, anthropologists are going to have to be, going to have to be interested. So anthropologists are obviously, obviously going to think about overarching processes, political economy, um, especially statecraft. So obviously in, in any sort of community, engineers and scientists are valuable because as Lily Irani, who, um, this will be my one reference of the talk, Lily Irani from UCSD, uh, looks at hackathons in India, and she says, you know, engineers and scientists, they're great for governments because they paint people as collaborative, not agnostic, technical, not political, constructive, not complaining. So what does that mean? Hackathons are good for government, right? Okay. Ethnography. So here I come in with my ethnography. Well, let's not paint these people as these duped capitalistic or neoliberal subjects. Let's not paint them at, as these coding heroes. Let's see how do they fill these spaces with meaning, hope, critique also, right? So spending all of this time, so I forgot to say this, between 2014 and 2016 mainly, I attended hackathons all over the place, mostly between US and Mexico. Um, and I continue to do so, right? Because we all know field work never really ends. Um, and one thing that I'm starting to develop here as, as I start my dissertation and to use this CS background so people, you know, anthropologists like borders. So I'm a computer scientist that now studies anthropology. So I'm thinking about as people are developing these apps, as they're developing projects using software, how do they use the logics embedded in the software? For example, a term called loose coupling that's about how to build a robust technological system. How do they start using that to relate out in the world? How do they think about their own social relations, their relations with different institutions using these logics? So we have the general public, anthropologists as these two different publics, and like as good ethnographers should do, as good anthropologists, we care about our research participants as well. So how am I going to speak to research participants? How is this work useful for them? One thing is, People are actually trying to develop things that help society. So is it a platform that's going to prevent urban crime? Is it a platform that's going to prevent uh, voting poll fraud? And if you look around even just this morning, seeing my, uh, a lot of my friends and research participants on both sides of the border sort of organizing around this earthquake that happened in Mexico. What, ha what else is happening in this organizing? What else is happening when communities come together? So there's a solidarity aspect of it. And then there's also the friction part of it, right? So there are tensions here. And something I want to explore is how does a, a, how does a construction of Latinidad play a part in all of this? Construction of Latinidad, what does that mean? How, are lat how is Latino identity, how are Latino politics reconfigured in these processes when people come together at these events in the name of empowering a Latino collective or a community of color, let's say. So those are the three publics I sort of had in mind, general public, anthropologists, uh, and my research participants. If you at all feel that you belong to any of these communities, even partially, I'd love to hear your feedback, or I'd love to um, have another public or community added to this list if you feel something is missing. And I'm really excited to be here at SAR. Look forward to your comments and to um, getting feedback from all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Hector. Next up is Dina Dart. This year's Anne Ray Fellow. Um, Dean is of Chumash origin. She received her BA and master's and doctoral degree from the University of Oregon. Till recently, she was curator of Native American art at the Portland Art Museum. Um, the title of her project at SAR is Negotiating the Master Narrative, Museums, and the Indian California Community of California's Central Coast. Haku Mitchumawish. I, I first want to um, begin by thanking the people of this land, the Pueblo people of this place. It's really important as a native person to always acknowledge the, the people who, um, who suffered and died and are buried in this place and who live and thrive and raise their children in this place. And so um, uh, thank you for allowing us to be here. And, <coughs> and thank you to the folks at SAR and all of you wonderful supporters of SAR that, um, that we can also be here. It's really um, a blessing. So um, 
uh, the way that I introduced myself, Met Shumawish, means um, how are we being healthy together. Um, the, the word health in my language um, is a verb. It's something that we do or we don't do. And, um, and we can't do it, it's, it's not a singular thing. You can't do health as an individual. You do health as a, as a community. And so currently we're doing health as a community here. Um, but my work looks at how, um, how we're doing health as a community in my homeland, which is the central coast of California. Um, as Michael mentioned, I am Coastal Chumash from the, um, my mom's family is from the Montecito area. And, um, and all my life, um, my presentation will be a little bit less structured and, um, and technical than Hector's, but um, because so much of this is really personal to me, um, so I'm an anthropologist, but I'm a native scholar first and foremost, and, um, and my work is really about um, bettering things um, for my community at home. So in, along the central coast of California, from San Francisco to San Diego, there are no federally recognized tribes. That whole um, strip of California coastline, the most expensive real estate in North America, is an Indian free zone. And, um, and I um, suspect because the, the representations of native people in the public spaces, the public history venues, um, is so poor <laughs> that those places actually play into the erasure and invisibility and disenfranchisement of the native people of the Central Coast. So not entirely, right? It's a systematic problem. Um, the, the fourth grade, third and fourth grade curriculum the, the textbooks that are used in public schools, um, the media, you know, all of these things sort of conspire knowingly or unknowingly to erase a native presence in California. So, um, so I, I set out to um, visit the, the history museums, uh, namely the mission museums that represent California history, Indian history. Um, along that four county region. It's also the home of four different tribal groups, including the Chumash. And um, so I visited the 54 institutions along the Central Coast that actually teach Native American history, um, either through their exhibits, their programs, or their supplemental um, uh, curriculum material, their, the teaching that they do for fourth grade. Um, in the fourth grade in California, they, uh, they the children learn about settlement of California, so they generally go to a California mission to learn this history, which you can see is probably a little bit problematic. So I visited the 19 um, operating Franciscan missions as well as all of the natural history, history um, and not art museums because art museums in that four county region don't actually have Native American art. Um, go figure. Um, so. I did this systematic, very critical study of the spaces and how people interact in those spaces and the dominant narratives. And then I interviewed Native people in that same region about, not only about the museums and the stories they're telling, but about their own oral histories and their own lived experiences as Native people. And then I sort of set those two things up. And they're very different sets of stories, as you can imagine. And, um, and then I made recommend, so this is all for my dissertation work, and then I made recommendations about how museums and missions can better uh, work with Native communities to tell a more authentic, more meaningful um, story about Native, Native life. So that was the project that I did about nine years ago, and um, my intention was to publish it, and, and I got great feedback from the University of Nebraska Press, and they're prepared to publish it with some editorial you know, um, work. However, in that nine years, I've worked in the field of museums, and, um, and I've worked as a Native person interfacing with the public, um, a largely ignorant public um, when it comes to Native American history. And so I've literally used my body as the interface. And, um, and so I'm very interested in um, this idea that Native people are called to into these spaces to actually re-traumatize themselves over and over again at the um, to, to educate the public about our, about our history. And, um, and I literally, for the last nine years, in the public sphere, have had that experience of, of being on the front line of that ig ignorance, right? And having to use my own personal experience and my own family's trauma as a, a teaching tool. And so I want to look at that, and I want to look at um, the activism in, in California um, among my community 
um, in response to that re-traumatization, right? There's constant re-traumatization, fiesta, re-traumatization. The, um, you know, the canonization of, of uh, Junipero Serra, further traumatization. How are Native people responding to that? So, um, so this, new, this new component, I, um, I think, I hope, is going to really bring the, the work current. So I'm going to use the work that I did um, as a doctoral student, but um, really make it more timely and also more personal uh, um, as I bring in my work from the last nine years in the field into that, into that work. So, thanks. Thanks, Tina. Um, next up would have been Pierrette Hondinho Sotelo, but she was called away to deal with a family emergency in California. But let me say a few things about Pierrette. Um, she's our Weatherhead Fellow very distinguished sociologist at the University of Southern California. Some of you, uh, her husband is Mike Messner, some of you may remember from two summers ago when he was a summer scholar, quite well known in his own right um, for his work on masculinities, and he was actually in Santa Fe studying um, Gulf War vets and their protests, their peace protests in town. Um, Pierrette is the author of many works, too many to list here, but they include God's Heart Has No Borders, How Religious Activists Are Working for Immigrant immigrant rights. The title of her SAR project is Roots in Raices, Latina, Latino Immigrant Integration in Black Spaces, which is a study of the transition of neighborhoods in LA from African American to Latino and what people's attitudes are about, about that. So we're really looking forward to having uh, Pierrette here on campus. Um, next up is uh, Milena Andrea Melo. She's another Mellon Fellow in Latino Studies. Um, Elena received her BA from the University of Texas Pan American and her PhD from UT San Antonio. She's just been awarded a position at Mississippi State where she'll be headed after she finishes up here, but we've got her for nine months and we're pleased. Uh, the title of her project is <clears throat> Enacting Life Dialysis Among Undocumented Mexican Immigrant Immigrants in the U.S.-Mexico Borderlands. Elena. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, the best way for me to contextualize this is to start off with a vignette. So Victor, a 32-year-old undocumented Mexican immigrant requiring dialysis for end-stage renal disease caused by hypertension, sits in the hospital waiting room against the wall. From a rural border town in between two counties, Victor drove an hour this morning to the hospital, a route that he knows like the back of his hand after being on dialysis for six years. He arrived to the ER at 5 a.m this morning with a pounding headache, nausea, swelling all over his body, and extreme fatigue from being unable to sleep lying down due to the fluid overload in his lungs that is slowly suffocating him. After waiting several hours, being triaged, poked, prodded, and asked the same questions he answers every time he arrives. The initial blood test results are delivered to the emergency room physician. Dr. Rodriguez shakes his head and walks over to room three where Victor has waited in pain and discomfort. Victor, he says, I'm sorry, but your potassium is not high enough for dialysis today. You're going to have to come back when you're sicker. <sighs> While his potassium is not high enough, his blood pressure is significantly higher than normal, but he is advised to take his regular medications and be on his way. Victor struggles to maintain his composure as he is led into the waiting area after being discharged around 11 a.m. He refuses to leave and tells the doctor, he feels horrible and is going to wait no matter how long it takes until they send him to dialysis. This is not how he normally feels. He knows that he needs dialysis in order to breathe easy again. The pounding in his head grows and grows along with excruciating pain in his left eye. Suddenly, he feels an intense burst and loses consciousness. From the stress placed on his body, the pressure in his eyeball skyrocketed. His eye exploded. Several days later, Victor leaves the hospital, finally able to breathe easy again, but completely blind in one eye as a result of being initially tur turned away. So I'm gonna come back to this vignette in a minute, but um, as a cultural anthropologist, I'm really interested in citizenship and agency. So it's the questions like, who is a citizen and why? Why them and not others? And what does that mean in their everyday life? And as a medical anthropologist, I'm really interested in health and healthcare. Uh, similar questions of who gets to receive healthcare, in what context, why, 
and so forth. So I brought these two together to really look at how do undocumented patients with end-stage renal disease understand and experience their lives at the margins of our healthcare system. And I do this specifically in the borderlands of South Texas, which is the region that I am from. Um, so now I'm gonna get a little technical and talk to you about what is end-stage renal disease. And some of you might know, but end-stage renal disease is when your kidneys are, uh, have failed completely. So to be on dialysis, your kidneys have to have be at a 15% or lower function rate. Um, so in order to make up for your kidneys failing, you need to go through this process called dialysis, which is that you're hooked up to a machine and basically it takes out all your blood, it cleans out all the toxins, and takes out all the excess fluid because when you're on dialysis, you usually don't urinate anymore. So that's why you see a lot of swelling happen. Um, so you need this process in order to survive. Uh, now, for a US citizen, automatically qualifies for Medicare. Um, and that covers 80% of the treatment. If not, you get Medicaid, other supplemental programs. Now, uh, you're supposed to get it three times a week. That is the standard of care. You get hooked up for three to four hours to the machine, and that does the work for you. Now, keep in mind, our kidneys work 24 hours a day. So really, if you're going to dialysis three times a week for three hours, your kidneys are only working three times, or three hours, nine hours total. Um, and you get a fistula put in, which is the thing that connects. And if you come to my talk, I'll get even more technical and show you pictures uh, in October. Uh, but if you're undocumented, you don't qualify for this. Um, the only way you can qualify for dialysis is when it is deemed an emergency. And not just any emergency, you have to be in a life or death situation. So we saw in the vignette that Victor, they told him, your potassium is not high enough. Now what I found throughout my research is your potassium had to be above a six. Now if your potassium was at a six, you and I would be having a heart attack right now. But uh, these patients' uh, bodies are pushed to that extreme every week. So at every week, they have to be at a risk of dying immediately in order to be able to live and get the life-saving treatment. Um, it's not it doesn't qualify for any of the Medicare, Medicaid, only emergency Medicaid. Um, and you don't get one of those fistulas. You get a temporary catheter that gets pushed in and out every single week. Uh, and it's only in through hospital ERs. There's five exceptions. I can talk to you about the exceptions later if you want. It's five states that have deemed it uh, always an emergency. Now, you don't ever qualify for a transplant, though, which U.S. citizens and uh, permanent residents do. So that's a brief overview of what happens. Oh, and if you're undocumented, you probably only get it once a week versus three times a week. So your kidneys are only going to work once a week. So you might go to dialysis and get um, six kilos of liquid taken out of you. So you'll lose 13 pounds in three hours. That's what happens. Uh, so I engage with uh, Foucault, who really looks at just like how our bodies are being governed. That's the easiest way I can talk about it. Um, and if you wanna look at a, 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 an example, the abortion debate, right? Does the government have the right to tell us what to do with our bodies? And I engage him with Agamben, who looked at uh, the bare life. And what he talked about the bare life was a life that was stripped of all its rights. So an example of that would be the Holocaust, when uh, Jews were stripped of their humanity in order to be killed. And I really bring in these two theories into conversation, but looking at agency. So who has the power to act? to resist, right? So how are undocumented immigrants acting in order to get access to care? And how are their providers acting too? Are they acting as uh, advocates or enforcers or mediators? And so I had three research objectives and I'll go through them fast. So one was to really look at how national and state healthcare and immigration policies shape treatment. So what is that shaping every day? And how do the healthcare professionals mediate this relationship between their oath to do no harm to their uh, responsibility to the patient and then their responsibility to the institution and to the healthcare system and to their employer? And then how do undocumented immigrants with ESRD, end stage renal disease, um, exercise agency to get dialysis? What do they do? And I do this, um, like I said earlier, in the Rio Grande Valley of South Texas. And I need to preface that um, this is important because it's just like we were talking about these zones, the valley is a constitution-free zone. That is what it's been labeled. So anyone at any time can be pulled over and asked for their citizenship. Um, it is highly surveilled. You might see uh, 40 border patrol cars or DPS vehicles within a 15-minute stretch. 
So uh, if you're undocumented in this region, you're always being surveilled, and you also can't travel out of this region because there's border patrol checkpoints within an, uh, 100 miles of the border. So people who live here say they are trapped, that they live in this cage because they can't go south back to Mexico because they'll die and they won't receive treatment, and they can't go north to seek treatment elsewhere. So they can't just go to the other five states I talked about that um, would give them access to care. Um, it is one of the most uh, uninsured rates in the country. It is uh, almost 40%. It has been uh, named the th uh, most obese city several years in a row, and then uh, one city got fatter. But we didn't get any skinnier, they just got fatter. That's what I like to say. Um, it is one of the most uh, highly diabetic regions in the country. Right now, one out of three people is diabetic, uh, but, but current rates say that it'll be one out of two by 2050. So out of every child that's born today, one out of them will probably become diabetic throughout their lifespan. Um, and obviously being on the border, it's a large immigrant population. High, high numbers are Hispanic or of Mexican descent. Um, so in my research, I did 14 months of field work in this region that I'm from. I did 42 semi-structured interviews with healthcare professionals. And what I mean by healthcare professionals is really anyone that had anything to do with dialysis. So uh, not only did I talk to the actual kidney doctor, but I also talked to the nurses, the technicians, the social workers, the hospital administrators, anyone that had anything to do with dialysis. I found them. Um, and then I did 100 semi-structured interviews with, an, with Mexican immigrant dialysis patients. So I wanted to compare what the experience was for those that did have access and those that didn't. So I did 50 who were Mexican immigrants who had become naturalized US citizens or lawful permanent residents, and then 50 who were still undocumented. But they were all low income. Um, and from those 100, I picked eight people to be my case studies. And those people I followed at least twice a month so a lot of them were like every other day um, throughout their everyday lives to see what, uh, what their lives were like in and outside of dialysis. So I would drive them to dialysis, I would go to their quinceañeras, I would go to barbecues, I would uh, definitely be there for doctor's appointments, anything that, that they would invite me to, I would go to. Um, and I followed the eight of them through this six months. Um, so this was daily participant observation. So it was also just what I saw in the hospital ERs while I was interviewing doctors, but also what I saw when I was there with the patients themselves. In hospitals, dialysis centers, patient homes, special events, rides to dialysis, and everyday life. Um, and I, my book so far is four main chapters, and it's looking at, the first chapter looks at really at the exclusion of the bodies of the marginalized. So how is this exclusion and these policies literally inscribed on their physical bodies, and also on their social and emotional worlds, and how do these lived experiences of policy engage with their lives. Um, I also looked at um, how patients exercise agency, right? So we saw in the vignette that they told Victor, your potassium is not high enough today. So what do patients do? Do they make their potassium higher? Do they eat a banana? Even though they know that that could kill them at any point. So what do they do? Um, or do they say other symptoms in order to increase their likelihood of getting dialysis? Um, and how does that affect their, their daily struggle with mortality and having to say goodbye to loved ones? Um, and then how does this affect their families and their broader community? So what does it look, feel like when your father can no longer work and the mom has to go to work or the kids have to go to work? Or you have to come to terms with the fact that you're 14 but your mom could die at any moment or be deported. And so it kind of overshadows the fact that your undocumented could be deported at any mo moment. You're, you can die at any moment. It takes it to one more extreme. And then what's the agency of the physicians? So like I said earlier, are they an advocate? Are they an enforcer or a mediator? Or are they all at different points in times? So my conclusions so far are that healthcare policy in the US creates these healthcare inequalities um, that we saw where Victor had to lose his eye in order to be able to get care. And that low income undocumented immigrants with ESRD are hit the hardest. Undocumented patients with ESRD risk their lives in order to get care, and their families suffer increased financial burden, stressful role change, and the strain of facing death in their everyday lives. Their providers struggle also by working at a point of paradox. And what can anthropology do to help us contextualize and uh, bring to life these stories and bring about policy change? So that's so far. Thank you. Thanks, Milena. I look forward to hearing more about that. Um, joining Pierrette Honda Yosotelo as a Weatherhead Fellow is Brian Smithson, who's a doctoral candidate at Duke University.
Brian's project is called Piety in Production, Movie Making in, Re in Religious Improvisation in Benin. Brian. All right, so this is going to be a little show and tell here. Um, so get ready. Uh, I think one way to sort of get an idea of what my research is all about is to think about objects and images and what they do in the world and in the cultural places where uh, all of us are doing our research. Uh, one approach when you see something like this in West Africa, where I do my research, uh, might be to ask, what is this? What is it used for? What is it made from? Um, what does it mean, maybe? But in my research, I. I try to use these questions as a springboard into a further set of questions, which are, how did it get to be that way? How did it get made? Why does it look the way it looks? Why does it mean what it means? Uh, and so that's kind of my intellectual entree into this, and that will kind of hopefully contextualize what I was doing and where. Um, my research was in West Africa on the border of Benin and Nigeria where I was looking at what is now the largest film industry in the world after the United States and India. This is Nollywood, the Nigerian film industry. Um, some of you may have seen these videos, these movies. They're, uh, they're kind of like soap operas or telenovelas, um, but they're, they're always about very African topics and, and um, concerns that are really on people's minds in Nigeria and the neighboring countries. Uh, I situated myself across the border in Benin, which is a very small country, um, formerly a French colony, and there I was able to look at how the Nollywood style filmmaking is being used and how people are making the movies there in a much, much smaller area, um, which had its uh, advantages as far as field work goes. Because, like I said, I was interested not just in what this thing means, but also how it got to be that way, why it means what it means, and for that, I adopted an apprenticeship model of, of field work. So participant observation is what all anthropologists do, but in this case, I wanted to work with the filmmakers, with the people who were making the props, like this is a prop for one of the movies, people who were um, designing the costumes, writing the stories, and to see their process, how they went through with this, and by doing that, to see sort of the different attitudes and opinions and uh, different viewpoints that were being expressed, which ones were being accepted, which ones were being rejected, and then to figure out, okay, who's making this comment over here, who's being turned down, who's making this comment over here that, okay, that's why it's, it's uh, gonna look this way because so-and-so's idea was the one that was accepted. And to think about these people, their identity, whether what their religious identity is, or maybe their prestige within the community, their age, all of these different categories to see how that bears on the final product that gets made. Um, but then there's another aspect to it because this is a very small community of filmmakers and because it's so small, they have no choice but to work together regardless of the fact that many of them come from one religious background or another one. So this is a place where you have Muslims and Christians and followers of indigenous Yoruba uh, religion all working together to make a single movie and then when you get to the other side of it, those movies are almost always about valuing their traditions and their indigenous religion. Um, I've, I neglected to mention this is Yoruba speaking part of West Africa. So it's an ethnic group that is by and large associated with Nigeria. They're one of the primary ethnic groups in Nigeria, but then in Benin and Togo as well, uh, they have significant amounts of Yoruba people living there as well. So by placing myself in this smaller area, it was, uh, it, it afforded me access, but it also was a way for me to understand how um, a, a minority faction of the Yoruba, the ones who are in Benin, are able to converse with larger conversations in the region, in Nigeria, but also in the African diaspora more broadly. Um, so I guess as an illustration, this is called an ikoko in Yoruba, uh, that means pot or jar. Uh, and this was used for a film that I was involved with to represent a divinity on the screen. This, so if you watch the movie, you'll see this thing flying and, and it's um, you know, shooting knives out of itself to like stop people from committing suicide. And it's 
blessing people with babies and twins and other things like that. Uh, and so, so it was a long process to get to that though. So for example, we were in the writing room. So as I said, I was an apprentice. So I was working with these filmmakers as one of them. I wasn't just sitting back in the corner and not really doing anything. I was part of the process to the extent that I could be as somebody who's coming from the United States and has a very, very different positionality than, than the people that I was working with. Uh, but we were in the Rydnish room and people were thinking they wanted to make this movie about this village that has kind of fallen on hard times and they need something to, to represent the divinities, the Orisha, which is the Yoruba word for God or divinity. So they were debating, like, should it be this particular God? Should it be this particular God? And they're bringing up these divinities that are, you know, real divinities in the community. But people are thinking, well, no, because we can't, we can't show the, their secrets on screen because the secrets are what make those divinities have their power. So the solution was to come up with something, a made-up divinity, something that they could just make up for this particular movie. And once that decision was reached, the question was, okay, what should this thing look like? Uh, and so there's another debate. People are saying, like, it should be, like, it should be a, a calabash, it should be a pot. Eventually they decide it's gonna be a pot. And then the question becomes, what's it gonna look like? People are posing, drawing diagrams on the board and coming up with different ideas. Um, and then eventually somebody, um, one of the more, most respected filmmakers there comes up with a, a, a photo on his phone that he took in Oyo, Nigeria. So Oyo is the town from which this particular village traces its, uh, its ancestry and heritage. And he says, well, this is one that I took in Oyo. And so then that was, he won. So they made the pot to look like that. Um, but, but it's these questions of sort of how people are coming to these conclusions that dro drove my research uh, and made me want to uh, just be on the set every day, be in these studios as people are editing films to see the conversations that are happening and specifically how those conversations are speaking to larger conversations in the region. For example, Nigeria now, many of you have heard of Boko Haram and there's a lot of talk about sort of terrorism and Christian Muslim animosities and so on. But this filmmaking had none of that. And so I was also interested in how they are able to hold it together to find that common ground and how these religious encounters between people are not leading to strife. In fact, they are uh, doing the exact opposite. And then the next step is in the dissertation, I'm exploring how these small conversations in this little country in West Africa are impacting the broader, uh, the broader region and also the African diaspora. And this comes in a couple of ways. The first is that Nigeria, like I said, uh, is a place where, especially among the Yoruba, there's been this long tradition of religious ecumenism, of people being tolerant of one another's practices and even of being fluid in their religious identities where somebody might be a Muslim, but they'll also go and visit the local Orisha shrine if they need something and maybe even go to church on Sunday. Uh, but that's breaking down. There's been a huge growth in, especially in Pentecostal Christianity in West Africa lately in the last 20 or 30 years where people are now no longer seeing their indigenous religion as something to, to be proud of and to protect, but instead as potentially diabolical, something that Satan has put there and we need to like reject it and, and figure out how to um, embrace world Christianity at the expense of our indigenous uh, identity. On the other side of it, in Benin, there is the state, which is really promoting indigenous religion as a, a way to attract tourists from the African diaspora, people who are now living in the Americas, but whose ancestors came over as enslaved captives uh, through the slave trade and the um, or the founding of this of the uh, Americas as colonial power, colonial. Um, sorry, I'm getting tongue tied here. Uh, the founding of the Americas as we know them now. So the the Yoruba people that I'm working with are caught between these two worlds, but they're also kind of in a crucial position between the two, uh, and that's what I'm teasing out in this in the dissertation. Um, so thank you very much. I appreciate. <laughs> The, the IARC staff may be alarmed to know that their pots might start flying or throwing knives. So let's hope it doesn't happen here. Um, the last scholar I want to introduce is Thomas Michael Swenson. 
the Katrina Lamont fellow, who's uh, Kodiak Alotique. He's a graduate of Westminster College and received his doctorate in ethnic studies at UC Berkeley. Comes to us from Colorado State University in Fort Collins. The title of his project is The Great Land, the Environment, and Belonging in Native Alaska. And Thomas is raising sartorial standards to a new height at SAR single-handedly, and he's greatly appreciated for that, Thomas. Thank you so much for the, the, kind, um, the kind introduction. Um, I'm a little shorter here. Um, uh, hello, Chimai. My name is Thomas Michael Swenson. Uh, I'm currently an assistant professor at um, the Division of Ethnic Studies at the University of Utah right now, just as of a couple of months ago. Um, and I'm really pleased to be here. I want to thank uh, the School uh, for Advanced Research, the staff, uh, the Board of Directors, and of course the President for allowing me to sit as the Le Mans uh, uh, Fellow for this coming year. I'm thrilled to spend my time here with such an array of scholars doing uh, really meaningful projects. It's really um, thrilling to be around them. Uh, I am here finishing the draft of a book manuscript entitled The Great Land, The Environment and Belonging in Native Alaska a project that traces indigenous belonging to Russia and the United States amid the industrialization of the continent's most western borderlands known as Alaska. The name Alaska derives from a native word, uh, Aliaskak, commonly translated as the Great Land, which Rus Russian functionaries adopted in the 18th century from native workers subjugated within um, gender coercive labor regimes spiraling towards ecological peril. In this project, the term the Great Land connects indigenous experiences of, con of compulsory belonging with tragedies caused by natural resource economies and struggling, struggles for land that prove paramount in shaping Alaska as a state in the Union. In telling the story, the Great Land makes visible how the nation's first long-term non-contiguous um, Colonial territory serves as a link between U.S. Western continental expansion and the establishment of overseas colonial possessions that followed the 1867 territorial acquisition. The first chapter, History and Progress, is about a film on a VHS tape I found in an unmarked envelope in an archive called Our Aleut History, Alaska Natives in Progress by Judy Peterson. Made by a fellow Kodiak Alutic in the 1980s, it seeks to mend the legacy of Russian colonization in the region with the lived 20th, 20th century experience of Alaska natives. As the title suggests, she is centering native people in what is typically narrated as a Russian and US uh, series of histories. Um, she attempts to deal with the history of native people in Russia, Russian extractive industries, and how that relates to the culture at the time it was made, the time the movie was made. In 2006, I went to a Kodiak, a Koniak Inc. Uh, meeting in Oakland and happened to sit down next to her. She told me that what I had found was a movie she made for a degree at um, the University of California, Santa Cruz in 1985. Uh, she said that she deposited, the Santa Cruz, Santa, deposited it in the Santa Cruz Library uh, without knowing that it was going to be uh, sent to an undocumented uh, part of an archive in, at Berkeley. Um, chapter 2, To Be Made Whole, examines how uh, after the Exxon Valdez oil spill in 1989, the Exxon uh, executive promised to make whole the uh, ecosystem and communities of Southern Alaska. This chapter explores how the shape of the nation in Alaska built upon centuries of extractive industries have caused multiple environmental problems for native Alaska. In the end, the chapter suggests that maybe the damage is beyond the powers of one corporation or one nation to uh, make whole the communities and the environments. Uh, and in doing so, I examine native artist and fisherman Mike Weber's work uh, in a shame poll he made uh, about, uh, the Exxon, about Exxon as an expression of grief and anger that's commemorative of a history of Alaska beyond the oil spill. Uh, the third chapter, Chimai America, which means Hello America, uh, on uh, the 18th of June, 2012, President Barack Obama met with President uh, Vladimir Putin to negotiate a partnership that would end the gen genocidal campaign in Syria. 
Uh, through their course of their discussion, they spent a moment commemorating the bicentennial of a former 19th century Russian colonial settlement in Northern California, known today as Fort Ross California State Park. In a joint statement, they said, quote, this year together we celebrate the 200th anniversary of Fort Ross in California, which was founded by Russian settlers and underscores the historic ties between our countries, end quote. This chapter, Chimay America, um, or Hello America, looks at how the state of California embraces uh, Fort Ross while marginalizing the history of compulsed Alaska Native labor that, that was coerced in bringing the sea otter to near extinction for the Russian American company in California. Chapter four, Extraction Standard Bearer, I examine the history and meanings of the Alaska flag. Designed by a 13-year-old Aleutic boy, John Benny Benson, in 1927. He prophesied the coming of statehood for the then territory that would happen uh, decades later in 1959. As an orphan, Benny came to represent an orphaned Alaskan territory that the United States would adopt and act as guardian for. Uh, in the Alaskan flag, Benson imagined a future for a nation in Alaska with its indigenous people. For the design of the flag, if you're familiar with this, has a double meaning that merges together. One is the constellation of the, of the great bear, which is uh, a Western belief, right? The, 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 um, the Big Dipper, or excuse me, excuse me. One is the constellation of the Big Dipper, right? Which is a Western belief. And the other, of course, is uh, the great bear, which is an indigenous uh, constellation. Uh, of an uh, uh, indigenous meaning of that same constellation. I'm off script here, pardon me. Um, and, uh, uh, and therefore, um, Benson's design asserts a blending of indigenous consciousness in the form of the bear and the extraction of natural resources in the form of the Big Dipper, right, which is just a big shovel, right, <laughs> taking fish, eventually oil, right. Um, uh, uh, Alaska as a territory and then a state in the Union would continue to be embodied by indigenous citizens providing labor for natural resource economies. Chapter five, uh, Civil Rights and Indigenous Sovereignty looks at the relationship between Alaska Native citizenship and the, complicated of uh, the complications of Native sovereignty in Alaska in the 20th century. Um, so after securing citizenship in the early part of the century, Native activists found, uh, fought for inclusion and against segregation by helping pass the Anti-Discrimination Act in 1945. A decade later, in the Supreme Court, the Tiaton case denied property rights to Alaska Natives because Congress had never recognized that Alaska Natives held such rights. Uh, and so this chapter then argues that the Anti-Discrimination Act failed to protect the discriminatory practice of denying property rights to its Native citizens. Chapter six, the, uh, the final chapter, Dear Howard, Am I the Organization Man? I examined the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act of 1971, which cleared the oil industry to begin uh, in Alaska through the writings of Fred Big Jim, an Inupiat uh, activist. He wrote a series of letters to an editor of the uh, native newspaper, the Tundra Times, to uh, uh, the editor being uh, Inupiat artist uh, Howard Rock. In these series of letters, disguised as a village elder, he questions the value for the not of uh, for-profit native corporations uh, the settlement engendered and how this would affect Native lives. Who be, uh, uh, natives then became shareholders in corporations and Fred Big Jim was very critical of that. Further, he still argues that corporations would gradually, uh, greatly change the relationships to land and subsistence practices. The chapter then relates the Native corporations with the work of Vine Deloria and William White, both of whom uh, thought about the rise of corporations at this time as a form of identity following World War II as an alternate to the American ideal of the rugged individualist. The Native corporations themselves came to reflect how non-Native America was going to imagine itself from that point on. Uh, the epilogue, uh, this is my fun, fun, this is fun part, the land of grace, uh, I don't want a foreigner coming in here and bashing us, looks at how in 2006, many Alaska Native villages refused free heating oil from, Ven from Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez because he had recently called um, their president, George W. Bush, a devil at a UN uh, meeting. Um, I then compare the 21st century economies of Alaska and Venezuela, both uh, at one time had produced 20% of oil, uh, or uh, each uh, for the United States, uh, for, the, for the needs of the United States. Um, and so I compare these economies and the recent decline of oil in order to think about what lies ahead for the great land. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, just to wrap up this first colloquium, which is 
it, within the uh, SAR, usually referred to as the table of contents uh, colloquium. Uh, we take uh, the opportunity to introduce our two terrific uh, museum interns uh, who are called Anne Ray Foundation interns. Uh, the first is Brenna Two Bears. Brenna is um, Navajo, but was brought up in the Ho-Chunk Nation in Wisconsin and went to high school in Indiana. She's a graduate of Whitman College and has considerable museum experience. Brenna. Yat e wajani wina hijan kishana hini kategi wina. She e brenna tubezi nishe, turachini nishle, aro wanagi wang shek yaki kadach hijan wan wanje, touching e dash che, standing rak su dash nella, akut ego dene aro ho chanka san nishle, kentlane de nasha. Hello everyone, my name is brenna tubez, and it's really great to see you all here. Um, I am uh, Bitter Water Clan, born for Warrior Clan. Um, my paternal grandfather is Standing Rock Sioux, and my maternal grandfather is Red Running Through the Water Clan. Um, and I, in these ways, I'm a Ho Chunk and Navajo woman, um, and I'm from Flagstaff, Arizona. And I'm very excited to be here, uh, especially to hear all of these amazing scholars' work, which I never really realized while I was hanging out with all of you. I just realized that you're all really smart. Um, and I just graduated three months ago, so I feel like I could learn a lot. Um, and I'm very excited to learn a lot. Um, a lot of my work has been, uh, like Michael said, with museums. Um, I worked with my tribal museum this summer, the Ho Chunk Nation. Um, I'm trying to, I was trying to help them get it started up. Um, it's going kind of slow. Um, so I hope that I can go to uh, graduate school and then go back and help more. Um, I also worked at other museums as kind of like, a, um, I'm going to say the token native to help them with all of their NAGPRA stuff, even though I was only 18, um, and <laughs> uh, to do uh, curation and conservation um, with a cultural aspect, so learning to respect the objects and um, have respectful curation of these objects in the way that I usually describe it to people who did not grow up with the type of upbringing that I did um, is if you think about um, a stop sign, it's just a sheet of metal, it's red and it has white like other shapes on it. Um, it's not actually gonna stop you, but <laughs> um, if we build a system around it, that means that there are consequences, like deathly consequences to not following it and that everybody follows it and that we have people ensuring that we follow it and if you don't, even if you don't like endanger your own life, you could endanger other people's lives and there are like smaller consequences and fines and stuff. But um, basically, without getting into too much detail of sensitive material, if you think about collections that have human remains or um, culturally sensitive objects, that's how you should think about it. Not, oh yeah, we want to be respectful and PC of these objects um, and the way other people view it, but like seriously take into consideration how harmful these things can be to us because they are really harmful. Um, and I also have done um, some work on my campus with um, instigating a, um, I guess, oral history, um, aspect to their um, orientation for first years, which took four years, and it took a really long time, um, and they didn't want to do it, uh, and I had to really fight for it. Um, and I think that that, as well as other work that I'm hoping to do here, is basic, basically about the um, advocacy for young natives, and I guess for just like native people in general, but I really focus a lot on people who are younger than me. I think about like my younger brothers and sisters, and um, any of my cousins who have, born, have been born recently and what kind of world I want them to grow up in. Um, and I do a lot of my work through the museum with that. Um, so I'm going to be doing a lot of work with um, the education, the collections management, and the registrar for the Indian Arts Research Center. Um, and I'm very excited to do all this work so that I can learn as much as I can and take it back to my tribe in Wisconsin. Um, yeah, thank you.
Thanks, Brenna. By the time Brenna finishes this very rigorous internship, she'll have learned that stop signs are just recommendations in uh, Santa Fe. <laughs> Um, the second Anne Ray scholar, uh, sorry, intern is uh, Samuel Villarreal Catnac from the Pueblo of Pojuaque, who received a degree from Arizona State University. He's worked for Pojuaque on a number of historical projects, and he's also worked with uh, Alaskan Native people, so he has a broad background just like Ben is. Samuel? Umbiagundi, Bingsingi Tamu, Navihoma, Samuel Vieri, or Katnag Yung Nao Homa, Opim Pet, Postumagi, or Winge, Yueri Yang Omu. Thank you all for being here. My name is Samuel. I'm from the Pueblo of Boaki. I'm here as an Anne intern, along with Brenna. Recently graduated from Arizona State University with a master's in American Indian Studies with a focus on indigenous language revitalization. Um, Prior to that, I worked for the Poe Museum, which is in Pewaukee. If you haven't visited it, take a chance and go do that. Um, um, so what I'm hoping to do here at the NRA internship, during my NRA internship, in addition to the, the normal curation project, which I'm excited about, as well as the registrar and collections management aspects, is to try to see if I can bridge the gap between indigenous language revitalization and museum collections, like what we have here at the AI, IARC, um, in hopes of finding a way to see how um, language learners can use these collections to facilitate language learning, trying to answer the question of, or beginning to answer the question of how can these types of collections be used to revitalize the languages that helped inform their initial creation. Um, because if we look at these pots and all of these other objects that are made um, for a longer period than, than has been where we're speaking English, they were made where the language was only spoken. That was the only language spoken. And so the whole world view of that was taken into consideration when these objects were made was through the that filter of that language. And in this area, with these materials from this area, all of these things come from this area. And seeing how the collections can be used to go back to the source of what helped to inform their creation. Um, I'm hoping to interview learners, fluent speakers, teachers, um, just go out there and see what can take place. And like Michael said, I actually did an internship in um, in Alaska last summer on the, in the Aleutian Island of Atka, where I learned a methodology where we basically, it, it was full immersion all of the time, but a main aspect of it was using props. So basically being in the language, doing real things in the language with real objects as the thing to facilitate the language learning. And so if there's a way to take these objects and have them play a similar role, that would be interesting but also bringing in the cultural aspect um, and that these things are particular to the language. So that's something I'm hoping to look at. Um, I'm excited to be here along with all of the other scholars and Brenna, my intern fellow. Um, yeah, so thank you. So that's our lineup for the next nine months. Um, just to thinking about the scholar program, um, the, the six scholars that were chosen this year came from a pool of 186 applicants, which gives you a sense of the competition for these, for these positions and also helps to explain why we've got some real talent here. Uh, I look forward to hearing uh, more about their projects and I hope you'll join us for the weekly colloquia, which will be held at noon in this room in the coming weeks. So that's it for today. Thank you very much and I hope to see, uh, see you again soon.